Hello, bonjour, good day. Welcome back to the UNITE Global Summit 2021. My name is Katja Roll. I am from the Joep Lange Institute and I am your conference host today. We are about to start our second session of this final day of the summit. For any newcomers, I invite you to make use of our conference app. In the app, you can ask questions, share comments, and connect with other participants of the, of the summit. You will also find information about all the organizations that are, in, in, that are involved in this conference in the app. Our second panel today is hosted by the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and by the Coalition UHC 2030. In this session, we will unpack the important question how we can secure the, the investments that are needed to build stronger health systems so that, we will leave, so that we will leave no one's health behind. Rob Yates of the Center on Global Health Security at Chatham House will moderate us in this session. And Rob has a truly remarkable program for you. Over to you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and greetings from the Centre for Universal Health at Chatham House in, in London. It's an absolute thrill to, to moderate this, this panel this afternoon. Um, we specialise in the political economy of health and, and health reform. So, so it's a wonderful opportunity to involve so many parliamentarians to this session and, and discuss the importance of, of politics and, and parliamentarians in achieving universal health coverage and sustaining universal health coverage. I think that the, the pandemic has shown beyond belief now the, the need for a global response to this. This has been a, a universal threat and requires a, a universal response. And, and the case for publicly financed universal health coverage, I don't think, has ever been stronger. And you've seen that countries at all income levels are adopting um, universal approaches. Um, so, so you have the situation even in countries like the United States now, you know, the government spending a lot of tax financing, ensuring that everyone gets access to, to vaccines completely free of charge. So this is a trend we're seeing at all income levels. And it's a, an absolute thrill to have participants from all over the world join us for this session from all corners of the globe, all um, campaigning for and supporting universal health coverage reforms. And I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion today and very much encourage our audience members to, to ask questions. We're going to have a specific Q&A session towards the end, uh, but do please feel free to start asking your questions earlier and then we'll have a better chance of seeing them and, and putting them to our, our panel in the, the later session. Um, so um, I won't say much for now, but I'll be doing links between the, the, the various um, speakers. And um, I'll introduce immediately our, our first speaker. In fact, it's going to be a, a video presentation from one of the, the great champions of universal health coverage, um, who, of course, is the um, chair, co-chair of the UHC uh, 2030 movement and honorary president of the Interparliamentary Union. And that's Gabriela Cuevas Babron uh, from Mexico. And we have a little video presentation from her. So if we can roll the video please and what better way to start this session thank you it is my pleasure to join you today for this session of the united level summit leave no one's health behind invest in health systems for all hosted by the global fund to fight aids tuberculosis and malaria and by uhc 2030 we are here today to discuss a very important and timely question what role can parliamentarians play on a global regional and national level to support the implementation of universal health coverage and the development of stronger, more equitable health systems that truly protect everyone from existing and future pandemics. We have an exciting list of parliamentarian speakers and participants across the world to share their experiences on accelerating the progress towards universal health coverage in their countries. UHC 2030 is the global movement that brings together diverse voices and perspectives in a shared endeavor to strengthen political commitment and promote collective action toward universal health coverage. It provides a multi-stakeholder platform to share experience and knowledge and develop guidance and advocacy tools 
to support more effective and coherent action based on a shared vision to strengthen health systems for both universal health coverage and health security. The Global Fund is a member of UHC 2030 and part of our partnership Global Health Initiative constituency. This collaboration between the Global Fund and UHC 2030 is an example of the type of collaboration we need to achieve good health and well-being for all by 2030. With just four days to go for this year's Universal Health Coverage Day, we are once again rallying together to remind the world about the imperative of universal health coverage. At this occasion, UHC 2030 will publish the 2021 State of Commitment to Universal Health Coverage Review, which consolidates diverse perspectives and summarizes progress, gaps, challenges, and opportunities in achieving universal health coverage commitments and action. As most of you know, this year's Universal Health Coverage Day theme is to leave no one's health behind, invest in health systems for all. To do so, we urge political leaders to accelerate the implementation of their commitments to achieve universal health coverage by 2030, to develop and communicate clear pathways to achieve universal health coverage in their country, to align health systems investments using a primary healthcare approach because remember, health is an investment, not a cost. Political leaders must also create space for meaningful social participation and value the involvement of non-state actors to identify and reach all groups in society as risk of being neglected, to ensure gender equitable leadership and gender responsive health systems and collaborate beyond the health sector on both universal health coverage and wider health determinants. Action is urgent. World leaders and the global health community have a crucial second chance to secure a safer and healthier future for everyone. Leaders must act on universal health coverage in their countries and come together to strengthen global health governance irrespective of any wider political differences. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the considerable health. So, uh, co the COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the considerable health, social, political, economic risks and consequences of falling to invest adequately and efficiently in health. Sadly, it has widened health inequities both within and between countries. We need resilient and equitable health systems that leaves no one held behind in crisis and in calm. We cannot afford to wait. This requires political decision and strong political will. At the end, it is a matter of leadership. In this context, parliamentarians have a crucial role to play. You are the best place to decide if we continue building a world full of exclusion and inequalities, or if we are here to write a new chapter for humanity. With no further ado, I give the screen to Rob Jade. Let me thank you for your invaluable support in preparing and moderating this event. And thank you all for joining us. Excellent, thank you very much indeed, Gabriella. If you're watching the recording, we really appreciate those excellent words and um, very much emphasizing there the importance of leaving no one behind. And I think it's recognizing the, the situation that the pandemic has exposed inequities. It has exposed, in all health systems, I think groups that have been tended to be left behind. That, that goes to my country here, the UK, with, with people in care homes and the elderly. And we, we've seen that migrant populations have often been left out as well. And clearly to ensure that, that uh, health reforms are truly inclusive and everyone is covered and no one gets left behind, it's a highly political process, and and you know we're we're delighted to have so many parliamentarians join us today in, in recognising this. And, and the way that we achieve true universal health coverage um, is when polit politicians and policymakers ensure that everyone gets covered. Um, now, who better now also to to introduce this 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 topic and, and give us uh, his uh, perspectives than uh, Professor Keizo Takemi from Japan. And uh, Keizo, lovely to be in touch with you again. Uh, Keizo, of course, uh, as well as being a member of the House of Councillors, the National Diet of, of Japan, 
is also a WHO goodwill ambassador for universal health coverage. And Japan has shown tremendous leadership in uh, the whole UHC movement over the last decade, decade or so, hosting summits to promote universal health coverage. So, so Keito, please, if you could give us in about the next five minutes your perspectives on, on the importance of, sort of the, the parliamentarian role in ensuring universal health coverage. Thank you, Rob, for the very kind introduction. And the good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I'd like to begin, begin uh, by sincerely thanking all the partners and the expat who has worked uh, tirelessly to organize this important meeting. And the most importantly, I deeply thank all the participants, uh, their attendance and attention. Uh, parliamentarians play an important role in advancing the UHC agenda and an ability to deliver the right to health to all the constituents of our nations. And in developing laws and legislation and ensuring and adequate the budget for those laws to be implemented, the parliamentarians are able to prescribe an essential package of primary health care services that underpin a nation, national, the UHC strategy. The keeping the right to health at the center of the health policy and legislation means ensuring that resources are allocated so that no one is left behind. In September 2019, world leaders endorsed the most ambitious and comprehensive political declaration on health in history at UN high level meeting on universal health coverage. Uh, we call on the parliament, parliament and the parliamentarians to create an agenda, set milestones and take action for achieving UHC by 2030 through the following six steps. Step one, the lead. The lead refers to commit to achieving universal health coverage for healthy lives and well being for all at all stages as a social contract. Japan as a case study. And step two, the protect. The protect refers to pursue equity in access to quality health services with financial protection. The Thailand as a case study. And step three, the legislate, the legislates the refers to the create a strong and enabling regulatory and legal environment responsive to the people's need. The Mexico as a case study. And step four, the advocate, the advocate refers to build the quality health services that people and the communities trust. The Turkey as a case study. And step five, invest. Invest refers to sustain the public financing and harmonize the health investments. The Rwanda as a case study. And step six, the collaborate. The collaborate refers to establish multi-stakeholder mechanism for engaging the whole of society for a healthier world and Zambia as a case study and make the commitment today to place UHC at the forefront of your political agenda and objectives. Uh, my warm welcome once again and hope uh, your active participation and productive discussions. Rob, thank you very much. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed, Keizo. And we were particularly uh, delighted to partner with the government of Japan uh, earlier this year doing the research project, looking at solidarity in, in tackling the, the pandemic and, and the importance of UHC, and recognising that there had been tremendous solidarity, I think, amongst the scientific community in, in producing all these wonderful vaccines. But unfortunately, you know, there's been quite a lack of political solidarity, which I think we're all very concerned about. Uh, sort of coming out of the pandemic and which we hope to resolve uh, in, in the coming years and months. So thank you very much indeed for, for joining us, Keito. That, that was fantastic. Now, uh, another organisation that's played a leading role in the, the campaign for universal health coverage is, is the Global Fund. Tremendous experience in providing uh, support on, on infectious disease control, particularly thinking of uh, HIV, TB and, and, and malaria. 
And now the Global Fund have got a huge role, of course, in, in the ACT Accelerator, in, in the health system strengthening uh, line. Um, so we're delighted to have with us today uh, Scott Wool, and, and of course the, the Global Fund is one of the co-hosts of this uh, session. Uh, so Scott, welcome, and uh, I understand you have a, a sort of short presentation for us, so if you'd like to bring your slides up and then over to you to uh, let us know what the Global Fund is planning on this front. Thank you, Rob. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, thank you to Rob. Thank you to the entire team at Unite uh, for convening this week's Global Summit and, and for giving us the opportunity to present this session today. Um, thanks also to UHC 2030 for their partnership co-organizing uh, today's discussion. And finally, an especially big thank you to all of the members of Parliament who've taken time from your busy schedules to, to participate uh, today and, and to support Unite's work to combat infectious diseases worldwide. Um, uh, I serve as the, the focal point for parliamentary affairs at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. This year marks our 20th anniversary, and in total, we've dis dispersed over $50 billion to well over 130 countries worldwide. And over the past two decades, the programs that we fund have helped save over 44 million lives. In countries where the Global Fund invests, deaths from HIV have dropped by 65%. Uh, from malaria by 45% and from TB by 28%. Uh, thanks to the generosity of 58 donor countries worldwide, uh, we're able to allocate uh, over $4 billion every year to fight infectious diseases. And, and in total, Global Fund investments represent over three quarters of all inter uh, international financing for the global TB response, um, over, over half uh, for the global malaria response and, and over a quarter of the global HIV response. And it's really important to note that, that every year, about a quarter of that funding, about a, a billion dollars every year, goes just to strengthening underlying health systems, which makes the Global Fund the largest multilateral grant funder for health system strengthening. We do this because strong and resilient health systems are crucial for progress against HIV, TB, and malaria. But of course, investing in health systems is also vital for a broad range of the sustainable development goals including improving access to primary care and helping put countries on a path towards universal health coverage. And as we've all learned the past two years, uh, vital for effective pandemic preparedness and response. This makes sense when you look at the investments we're talking about. Training health workers, including community health workers, improving supply chains, strengthening laboratories, surveillance, community-led monitoring, data systems, financial management, all of which are critical for pandemic response. Uh, as a result, the Global Fund Partnership is uniquely positioned to support low and middle income countries in responding to COVID-19. Uh, given our 20 years of experience in fighting existing pandemics and, and our track record of impact, we've shown we can deploy financial resources swiftly and invest them well. And we've also seen that these investments over the past two decades in building stronger health systems to combat existing pandemics have actually formed the foundation for the COVID response in many countries. But there's no doubt that COVID is severely impacting progress. Um, the impact has been particularly devastating in terms of access to testing and treatment for TB, uh, as well as uh, access to prevention services and testing for HIV. Um, although 4.7 million people were reached to receive TB treatment in 2020 in the countries where we operate, this actually represents an 18% decrease relative to 2019. And that translates to a million fewer people receiving TB treatment. For HIV, we did see a 9% increase in access to antiretroviral treatments in 2020, an enormous achievement given uh, the challenges of, of COVID. Um, but we also saw an 11% reduction in accessing HIV prevention services and a, an overall 22% reduction in HIV testing. And that translates to 30, 37 million fewer people being tested. Uh, these sharp decreases in testing for, for TB and HIV in particular will inevitably translate into more infections and, and more deaths in the coming years. Um, when COVID first struck, the Global, Global Fund did respond quickly. And, and so far, we've allocated an additional over $4.1 billion to help more than 100 countries worldwide with their COVID responses. And, and it's important to emphasize, as this slide shows, this is in addition to the core funding we provide annually to combat HIV, TB, and malaria and to strengthen health systems. 
So we're now the primary channel for grant support to low and middle income countries for all of the non-vaccine components of their COVID responses, um, including tests, treatments like medical oxygen, and, and personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, gowns, sanitizer to protect healthcare workers. Our funds are also going towards adapting life-saving HIV, TB, and malaria programs so that they can continue functioning effectively during COVID and to other investments to reinforce fragile health systems that are being asked to do a lot during this pandemic. These investments have, have catalyzed many health innovations that can now be scaled up to regain uh, lost ground in the fight against infectious diseases. For example, things like multi-month dispensing uh, of medicines, using digital tools for prevention, education, and counseling activities, uh, and for treatment adherence support, and, and really importantly, increased utilization of community health workers to provide information, tests, medicines, and, and other health commodities door-to-door. Uh, -door. So, so we're a proven financing mechanism to, to help those innovations reach the people who need them. Uh, and we've learned quite a bit during COVID. There, there's a real opportunity now to integrate services better uh, and, and more effectively tackle multiple pathogens at once going forward. So for example, when we see patients with, with respiratory systems, it's possible to have the capacity everywhere to conduct testing, surveillance, sequencing for both COVID uh, and TB and other respiratory illnesses. Similarly, when, when a patient presents with fever, we should have the capacity everywhere to determine quickly whether it's malaria, COVID, uh, COVID or another illness. But deploying these innovations at scale and in an equitable way to the poorest countries does require more funding. The inequities we're seeing in access to COVID tools, um, not only vaccines, but also diagnostics, medical oxygen, uh, personal protective equipment again, clearly demonstrates that, that more investment is needed globally to deliver the tools that innovators are providing. We've allocated the additional uh, COVID funds that we've raised very quickly, and we would argue efficiently, and we're soon gonna run out of money for that purpose. Uh, allowing the virus to spread unchecked anywhere in the months to come puts us all at risk and it fails to implement these lessons that we've learned uh, during this pandemic. Other speakers have mentioned the, the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator. Um, we played a leading role in helping found that. Um, this is a, a, a coalition of global partners designed to close these gaps in access to new COVID tools. Um, so far, the majority of resources that have been mobilized for that effort have been focused on vaccines. Um, but Delta and, 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 and Omicron, these variants, have demonstrated vaccination alone is not a silver bullet. Beating COVID requires a sustained and comprehensive uh, uh, response. Again, combining vaccines with tests, treatments, PPE, we can't let up on any of these fronts. And, and we're ready to continue to be a significant channel for the deployment of non-vaccine support. Um, in particular, we stand ready um, to ensure uh, affordable access to new antiviral drugs that are in the pipeline uh, now to treat COVID. Um, but the greatest pressing needs go forward relate to your role as parliamentarians. The, the greatest needs are, are not at the moment around additional scientific progress, it's around political commitment and financial resources. Uh, a, a really key message uh, to emphasize today is that existing ODA funding is not going to be enough to cover needs going forward for pandemic preparedness and response. More is going to be needed. Um, at the Global Fund to, to respond to these challenges, uh, uh, we have uh, just uh, put out a new multi-year strategy uh, that's designed to get progress back on track against HIV, TB, and malaria. So to enhance our impact, we're going to put an even greater focus on equity and innovation take more actions to tackle human rights and gender related barriers to accessing services. And, and, and we're gonna leverage the fights against HIV, TB and malaria to build more inclusive, resilient and sustainable systems for health that are better able to prevent, to identify and respond to pandemics. And uh, I'll just end by, by emphasizing that um, next year is gonna be especially critical for implementing this new strategy and for our continued progress. Um, every three years, we raise funds for the subsequent three-year grant cycle. Uh, we refer to these as replenishments. Uh, the United States will host our seventh replenishment in the fall of 2022. Strong support from parliamentarians worldwide was vital for the success of our sixth replenishment in 2019, where we raised over $14 billion, and that was a 15% increase over the previous three-year cycle. But as we all know, the needs now are, are greater than ever. Um, we also work closely with countries to increase domestic investments in health, 
Uh, and this is an area where we've seen remarkable progress over the past decade, a clear example of political will and commitment in action. And in fact, we saw those investments increase by 44% during the last three year grant cycle. So the replenishment process will kick off in mid-February um, when we release an investment case. And that'll include both a fundraising target and also a target for continued increases in domestic financing for health, again, in the over 130 countries where we operate. Success on both of these fronts will be essential to restore sustainable progress against HIV, TB, and malaria. And, and finally, just to reiterate, as other speakers have said, one of the most important lessons we've learned fighting pandemics is that political will from you as parliamentarians, but also working with your government partners, ministers, heads of state, is absolutely essential for successful resource mobilization and therefore success is essential for meaningful progress. And our results um, these past two decades represent clear proof that political will, when it's combined with global commitment and community leadership all working together, can force the world's deadliest infectious diseases uh, into retreat but we cannot do it without your leadership and your support. So thank you again for this opportunity today. And uh, back to you, Rob. Bob, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Scott. That, that's, that's wonderful. And I, I think that the current situation uh, concerning vaccines and making sure that they get rolled out across the world really does illustrate the importance of having strong, secure health systems. You know, that we're, we're clearly seeing that, yes, supply, I think, is the main issue, particularly getting... Uh, vaccines into sub-Saharan Africa, but, but then the huge logistical problems about making sure they're getting to people's arms now really does show that, you know, long-term investment in strong health systems is absolutely vital and, and something where parliamentarians and, and, and technical operators are, are extremely important. Um, so now we're going to be sort of turning, I think, to people who are sort of at the country level and very much at the front line of, of, the, of these debates, ensuring that health systems are strong and secure and that, that uh, services reach absolutely everyone. Um, we've got a slight change to the programme now that, um, that we were going to be having um, a speaker from, from Zambia, uh, Carol Nwena Kachenga, but unfortunately she's not uh, going to be able to be with us today. But we're delighted that very, very short notice uh, that, that uh, someone has been able to, 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 to step in um, and delighted that that, that is um, someone engaged in the the frontline fight to tackle TB in India. Um, and that's uh, Dr. Ramya, who represents REACH, uh, an organization that's been working uh, to provide services and campaigning on TB services uh, in India. So um, Dr. Ramya, I, 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 if you could give us your perspective on, on the situation in India and, and you know, sort of uh, how, how health systems are, are being strengthened and you know, potentially the role of politicians uh, in India. Thank you. Um, thank you very much and um, um, thanks for this opportunity to share our experiences. Um, over the last 21 uh, years, uh, REACH based in India has been working closely with those affected by TB and their families. And I would like to share our experiences of engaging communities uh, to reach out to the larger community groups uh, in India. Uh, recognizing the clear need to broaden the response to TB at the community level uh, with the help of non-medical and intersectional approaches uh, to improve the qualitative experience of vulnerable communities along the CAC cascade, uh, we started working closely um, with the affected uh, communities. Uh, we have been a recipient of the Global Fund grant uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, following the country level CRG assessments and through the call to action initiative, uh, we aim to build a national movement by involving affected communities and by positioning TB Free India as a collective goal. We demonstrated a rigorous mechanism of identifying, training, hands on mentoring, and engaging TB survivors as champions. What was very heartening was to see their willingness to engage in the TB program and an extremely high motivation to proudly wear the badge of TB champions coming out of the stigma of the disease to work for their local communities. Um, our work with the affected communities has truly been uh, a transformative response uh, by educating, engaging and empowering these TB survivors. Uh, we have been able to trigger a paradigm shift from passive community engagement to full community participation and ownership. 
Uh, the survivor-led uh, networks facilitated by us have been able to showcase uh, the potential power of solidarity among the communities and to provide a framework to synergize their individual efforts uh, to encourage cross-learning between the networks and also to challenge, channel the voice of all the affected members to the decision makers. Um, some of these networks have been trained on leadership and uh, are well poised to sustain their efforts and take on larger public health responsibilities. Um, through the TV forums, uh, the TV champions shared a common platform with policymakers and um, brought the grassroots challenges to the discussion table. Today, we have thousands of TV champions in the country who are involved in service delivery that is providing direct care and support. Uh, they are uh, peer counselors uh, using their own personal stories to provide psychosocial support to other people with TB. They are effective community monitors and facilitators of TB response, promoting overall accountability and also helping in improving the quality of the services. Today, TB champions and survivors are working alongside the program in advocacy, in planning, implementation, and audit of the local, state, and the national TB response. Today, they are listening to each other and actually finding local solutions for their local needs. So we are uh, building um, towards uh, creating this critical mass of TB champions uh, through a recent Global Fund grant where we are planning to do a country-level scale-up of this engagement. Uh, looking beyond TB, the TB champions are increasingly recognized as leaders within their communities and have become the go-to person for all the health issues, even beyond TB. Uh, most of them have uh, uh, reported advancement in their knowledge, skills, and overall standing. In addition to the efforts to engage in communities, uh, we've also empowered the TB champions in multiple aspects of their own lives. Today, they ha we have plenty of anecdotal evidence of empowerment. The TV champions have uh, related experiences of increased self-worth, agency, social, political power. It's very, very heartening to see the kind of personal and professional empowerment they are going through. The TV champions have been counseled, um, have been trained on counseling and effective communication. And we've now understood how the TV champions uh, are changing to public health champions. And, uh, They've continued to positively influence uh, and shift the way communities are engaging with the public health system, as was during the COVID times, when the TB champions played a critical role in reaching out to the larger communities for COVID awareness, vaccination uh, information, and helping uh, generate local solutions. So we have learned that investing in community systems positions the community and the national public health program as co-facilitators who will enhance the efficient delivery of healthcare services in ways that speaks to individual needs, particularly to members of key affected and marginalized population across the CAC cascade. It will lessen the burden on health system, reduce stigma, and leverage the social determinants to strongly establish epidemic preparedness, accountability, and responsiveness at multiple levels. So it is very, very important to invest in the community. That's our experience from India. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Very clear messages about investing in communities. And I want to wear that I think the Indian government have set a target to eradicate uh, TB by 2025. So obviously, there's a lot of pressure now to deliver on that and, and how important truly universal health coverage will be to attaining that, that, that goal. Um, right, next, um, I think we have a, a, sh a short video um, that, that we'd, we'd like to, to, to bring on, please. So, so if we can have the, uh, the, the video clip, which uh, hopefully my, my colleagues are going to be able to bring up for us, and it's about how we change the story. Where you live cannot decide whether you live. When millions were dying from preventable diseases, we all had a choice. Accept it or fight. Do nothing or say no. Not in our lifetime. Not when the knowledge and skills to save those lives are ready and waiting. Not now, not ever. You know, right now, we're on track to end the scourge of HIV AIDS. That's within our grasp. And we have the chance to accomplish the same thing with malaria. We refuse to accept it. We took action. We changed the story. 
brought people together from all over the world, from every background, gave them all an equal voice, united against the world's deadliest diseases. No egos, no spectators. We had to be all in. And it's worked. We've become a force that can face tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV head on. $14 billion is not just cash. It is the four pills I need to stay alive. A force that saved 38 million lives in 20 years. And now we're here, together. We know the job isn't finished. We still have a way to go, new challenges to face. But we have taught each other, helped each other. We're stronger now than we've ever been because of the choice we made, the choice to do something to change the story. When I first mooted the idea of a global fund, quite a lot of people laughed it off saying, there he goes again dreaming. You know, and I, I love dreams. It always starts with a dream. Thank you very much indeed for that, that uplifting video. And, and the, the final clip there, of course, of, of, of Kofi Annan, the, the former chair of the elders, um, a group of former world leaders who have been campaigning for universal health coverage and, and you know, addressing um, this very important issue with current heads of state. And I think recognizing you know, how important, I think the video shows very neatly there, you know, the important coalition of, of technical actors, civil society uh, activists, you know, sort of people campaigning for this, but also the vital role of policymakers and parliamentarians in, in listening to all that and actually implementing the reform. So I think that really neatly, if you look at the video, how many of those people fit into those categories of civil society activists, both politicians and, and technical agencies. Um, we're now going to switch continents and, and we're going to be looking specifically at uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And again, in, in the video there, you can see a number of African countries uh, featuring there very, uh, very prominently. Um, so our, our next uh, panelist is going to be Murray Rose and Gwenny um, Effa, who is a member of the National Assembly of Cameroon. Um, and, but more than that, is also president of the African Parliamentary Forum on Population and Development. So, so greetings uh, from, from London and uh, Murray Rose. If you can give us your perspective from Cameroon, please. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, perfect. Did you hear me? Just about, and, and I think your 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 camera seems to be at an angle. And uh, so, so maybe if you prefer, prefer to go back to to portrait, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Can I go away? That that Hello? Yes, yeah, so please kick off. I have a <laughs> Did you hear me? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Thank you. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, honorable member of parliament from around the world, fellow participants. It's my great honor to represent the African Parliamentarian Forum of Population and Development this morning at the United Global Summit and participate in this important panel of LEAF no one health behind invest, invest in a health system for all. As we build up the international celebration of Universal Health Coverage Day, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to introduce the African Parliamentarian Forum on Population and Development to you and all, to you all and showcase your effort in universal health coverage. The FPA was established in 2019, which like mine, African MPs, champion of ICPD, gender equality and universal, universal health coverage. You are about 150 strong member based on your organization representing 18 countries from across the African continent. Our members are passionate about the full spectrum of the ICPD's intervention, gender equality, and universal health coverage. They advocate strongly from this issue using traditional means such as radio, 
a newspaper article as well as contemporary social media posts of Twitter or, face or Facebook. In our effort to find means of improving our work and measuring member of our forum request our secretary design a tool which can be used in a handy manner to ensure uniform and accurate messaging of USHC. In 2019, during a meeting in Kigali, Rwanda, African USA champion MP discussed a handbook which can be used by all legislators to ensure Universal Health Calvary become in a, a reality in both their national country and region as well. Our secretariat together with key partner, including I would say UHC 2030, who UNFPA and many other began to work of produce producing a USDA guide from MPs. The final project includes include six action steps to achieve USC. These are protect, lead, invest, legislate, advocate, and collaborate. This action step provide a framework of MPs on how to tangibly create an agenda, set milestone, and take action step in achieving universal health coverage. The full document consists of 10 full modules, which have been worked on by experts in this field and were supported by nearly 40 MPs from around the world, representing 30 MP networks who complete an MP survive on the USC guide priority areas. The 10 models are entitled prim one, primary health care, second, health system strengthening. Three, budget appropriation and accountability. Four, global health security. Five, immunization. Six, uh, sexual health, public health, and, excuse me, and maternal, excuse me, and reproductive maternal newborn, child, and adolescent healthy and nutrition. Uh, and uh, family planning. Seven, gender equality. Eight, HIV eight. Nine, the human right to science. 10, non-communicable disease and the digital divide. The MP who participated in, who participated in this survey vote overwhelmingly the, for the primary health care as their priority following by health system strengthening and budget appropriation and accountability, which were a tie. This module was supported by experts from organizations who focus on this area and have been designed to offer MPs the most tangible example of action to take in this areas. The COVID-19 pandemic has proved the, has proved the importance more than ever to build the capacity of legislators on issues like humanization and global health security. With this universal, cov uh, universal health coverage guide those, this is one of the reasons that this has become a global tool. Its relevance and need are global. Therefore, in conclusion, I encourage, all, I encourage all the MP present to use this tool at your disposal. It is available in the, on the website of USA 2030, as well the European Parliamentarian Forum of SR. It has been translated into six UN languages for ease to, of use. Thank you. That's all that I have to. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Mary Rose, and and thank you for for explaining the parliamentary guide so so effectively there. That the and I really commend everyone who produced this because I think we should recognise that we in global health haven't often been very good at communicating the merits of universal health coverage to parliamentarians, and you know this is a great step forward and an extremely useful guide for for people to refer to. Um, I think we're, we're marginally behind on the clock, but not too badly. Uh, so so I'll, I'll go straight to our next video, please, which is uh, uh, UHC leaves no one behind. Let's work together towards good health and well-being for all.
In September 2019, at the United Nations high-level meeting, world leaders endorsed the most ambitious and comprehensive political declaration on health in history. The next meeting in 2023 will be a significant opportunity for heads of state to reaffirm their commitment and to recognize the role of universal health coverage as an overarching umbrella for Sustainable Development Goal 3. Therefore, a group of health partnerships are establishing the Coalition of Partnerships for Universal Health Coverage and Global Health. Achieving universal health coverage is the key to making meaningful progress for all areas of health. If access to quality, affordable services is universal, people affected or at risk of diseases will be able to get the services they need to live a healthy life without suffering financial hardship. That's why we should unite under a common health goal. Recognizing the need for greater collaboration and harmonizing across health programs, the coalition brings partnership to align advocacy and accountability efforts. In too many countries, health services are poorly funded by public resources. As a result, people struggle to access necessary health services or are forced to pay for them out of pocket. Universal health coverage encourages governments to deliver services based on the principles of the human rights, equity and need. Because when we can close gaps, and improve coverage across wider population. We free up limited resources for more targeted health programs. Rather than working in silos, we are coming together to promote comprehensive people-centered care that leaves no one behind. In the coming years, we will work together to promote socio-political accountability mechanisms that are inclusive, evidence-based and country-led to increase and improve coordination among the various health initiatives and to strengthen existing accountability mechanisms for the Sustainable Development Goals. We are thrilled to embark on this journey together. Let's work together towards good health and well-being for all. Universal Health Coverage leaves no one behind. Super, thank you very much. Wonderful video, inspiring video from the wonderful UHC uh, 2030. And I'm, I'm proud to be wearing the, the symbol, the coverage symbol uh, myself today. And we, of course, we're all really looking forward to the 2023 high level meeting at the United Nations, where I'm sure we're going to be sort of taking stock on the, the pandemic and how the world has really performed in uh, attaining its UHC objectives over the last uh, four years, it will be since the, the previous meeting, and uh, obviously hoping to do a lot better. Uh, going forward to making sure that everyone gets the health services they need with financial protection. And of course, we recognize, and it's very much the theme of the, the entire summit, you know, just how important parliamentarians are and, and political leaders are in these processes. One can only reach universal health coverage uh, through a system whereby healthy, wealthy people pay for health services for, for the sick and the poor. And you have that uh, pooled function of ensuring that everyone gets the, the health services they need. And this is a highly political process. We, you know, we know across the world there will be vested interest groups who will actually try and oppose that, but yet it's the majority of the population who will benefit from it. So it really is a sort of a feature of political processes to, to make sure that, um, you know, that this happens uh, effectively and, and fairly. Um, so now we're absolutely delighted that, that we are going to be turning the conversation to policy makers and, and we have MPs joining us now to describe the situation in their own countries. If I can just remind participants that this is your opportunity to, to pose questions, um, maybe to the panel in general, although maybe a certain MP that you would like to identify and in which case do please ask your questions and they're, they're popping up on my screen to my left. I can see that already we have three or four come in so I'm, I'm delighted to, to see that. Um, now, we were going to have our first speaker actually as my own MP, uh, but really, I think to, to, to illustrate, uh, you know, the, the situation that we, we find ourselves in, you know, the importance of uh, parliamentarians holding their governments to account on this, 
we have the, the situation that, that Dr. Rosena Alin Khan, who is uh, an MP here in London, um, isn't going to be able to join us because she's actually in the Houses of Parliament now um, asking a question of Boris Johnson in Prime Minister's Question Time, which happens every week uh, in, in the UK. And I understand that she's been selected to ask a question about our government's handling of the, of the COVID crisis. And this is very topical in the news in the UK at the moment. So uh, unfortunately, Dr. Rosetta Allen Khan can't join us today, but you might see some of her interventions on the television tonight when she asks questions of the Prime Minister uh, about the COVID response here in, in, in the UK. Um, but I am absolutely thrilled that we, we have uh, parliamentarians from around the world though joining us now. And um, I will come to you um, in turn. And perhaps if you could sort of give us four or five minutes perspective uh, from your own countries about your journeys towards universal health coverage and the role of parliamentarians in, in ensuring that, that you reach that, that noble goal. And the, the first MP we have joining us is uh, Professor Habib Amilat, who is a member of parliament in Bangladesh, a, a country that's made very good progress, particularly in providing primary health care in rural settings uh, over recent years. Uh, Professor Milat, how's been the approach uh, to attacking UHC in Bangladesh? And maybe how do you see the COVID pandemic uh, impacting on your UHC progress going forward? Thank you, Rob. Thank you for inviting me. And greetings from Bangladeshi Parliamentary and Forum for Health and Wellbeing. As you know, when I was uh, Inter-Parliamentary Union Health Advisory Committee Chairman, we took a resolution from in Inter-Parliamentary Union in 2019 how the parliamentarian can act to implement USC. As you told about Bangladesh, Bangladesh is progressing uh, reasonably well, I shouldn't say very well, but reasonably well. As you said, the primary health care is very strong in our country. We have community clinic, uh, for each community clinic for 6,000 people. They're run by the health workers. So uh, the, 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 the underprivileged people are getting health care from there. The COVID situation has uh, taken it a little bit back. And as you know, our Prime Minister, our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has committed for implementing USC. And she also had a very clear uh, commitment for that. So we are very happy for that. The problem was that the COVID came and we are a little bit behind. And, but in our country, as you see that uh, health expenditure is uh, very high in a sense that out of pocket expenditure is about more than two thirds of the total budget is a, a out of pocket expenditure, Six is more than 70%. And also, about 14% are pushed to poverty due to health expenses. And also about 12 to 14% people has to spend about 10 to 15% of the, their household income. So it's a huge figure. Another issue is that we are celebrating our uh, 50 and 50th anniversary of independence. But even then we are, uh, budget is still 5% health budget is around 5% of the total budget. And it is in G GDP where it should be 5% is around 1%, we are around that. Of course, the health system is doing well. We have employed more than 20,000 doctors, about 18,000 nurses and increased 12,000 hospital beds in our country over the last few years, but still 180 million people. So we need, we need to go more and more. And what happened is implementation of the USC is more than 50%. We, we, there are still room to uh, improve actually. And as you see that COVID, as I said, that we have 180 million people in our country. So far we have done, uh, well, 100 and, 104 million already got the vaccination. So the fully vaccinated about 23.4% of the population which is about 40 million and single dose about more than 65 million people got. We were looking for vaccine everywhere because of the inequity, we didn't get it. We didn't beg for a vaccine. We were look, we have the money to buy vaccine, but we couldn't get it. Now the vaccine uh, has started. We have very strong expanded program of immunization in our country. And we see that we can, uh, we can give vaccine, but because of the, there's huge demand and supply was so minimum and also inequity because the Western countries, the US, they were keeping the vaccine more than they need and they have posted as well as you see the report. So we do not, and our people, those who need vaccines, especially the elderly people, 
they didn't get the vaccine and they suffered, they died. Of course, we are lucky compared to other neighboring country like India and other country, our death was only uh, 28,000. But it's a, it's a big number for us in a sense that any life lost is a, is a loss for us. So what I am to tell you that as uh, Gabriela said, action is urgent for implementing USC. We are discussing, we are making papers, we are having so many documents in the internet and the published, but implementation, where is that? We need to, we need to keep an eye on that, that how can we implement As a member of parliament, as I said that we have to get a resolution and uh, Gabriela also wrote a letter to each and every parliament, but I don't see any active role from the, uh, from the decision makers or there's bureaucratic. In our country, we have started piloting project in the universal health coverage, but the pilot has been started eight years ago. We don't have any insurance system in our country. We need to implement that. As we have progressed in the MDG and SDG, different stages in the primary healthcare, but in the secondary tertiary healthcare, we are not doing that well. Another thing is that, as you say, I saw the global, I know Scott very well, he was involving with us during the resolution of the IPU. And I saw inequal distribution of the money because the two thirds of the population lives in Asian uh, subcontinent, or Asia, China, uh, India, Bangladesh. But I think this even not one fourth of the money is going to that part of the world. So we need to believe at that. Also, you have to look at the communicable disease, no doubt about that, but non-communicable diseases, heart disease, blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, that is actually uh, progressing you know, the non-communicable disease but because of the lifestyle improved. In our country, we are facing same problems. So we need to work together, not only discussion, but we need to see the action and we need support, support from all quarters that we can implement all those things. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. And I'm delighted that you, you raised the issue of vaccine inequity, and you know, which obviously has been an absolute disaster this, this year. And, and uh, I think so many of us in global health are, are really very uh, disconcerted with the, the fact that countries like my own, you know, have commented so many of the vaccines and that you have shortages in, in Bangladesh. And, and it, it really is an indictment to the international system that that's been the case. And uh, we've seen that, you know, the failure of the G7 and G20 to take this agenda seriously. And if we're serious about tackling this pandemic, we must do something about this. So, so, so I think, you know, all credit to you for, for raising that and, and hope you will continue to do so at International Fora. Um, so now if we can go uh, to uh, Morocco, please. And, and um, we are delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Ibtissam um, uh, Azawi, um, who is an MP from, from Morocco. So can you sort of outline what your approach has been to uh, UHC? Good afternoon. I'm Ibtissam Azawi, uh, member of the United Network, chapter chair of the United Network at the level of the MENA region. I'm a former member of parliament. So we had elections a few months, a few weeks ago, and I'm now I'm an elected uh, municipal official at the level of the city council of Rabat. I'm happy to participate in this interesting round table on a very important topic, especially at the level of the MENA region. I strongly believe that politicians and especially parliamentarians have a critical role to play in securing resources to build stronger health systems that leave no one's health behind through advocating and working on implementation of ambitious and innovative legal frameworks through also challenging governments while discussing each year the, for example, the budget law uh, and through challenging all concerned stakeholders. Politicians and parliamentarians can work to ensure continued progress toward universal health coverage and health security by building resilient and more equitable health systems that are prepared to respond to existing and future pandemics. Morocco, for example, was able to turn some challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic into opportunities. And we are living now a real revolution regarding the health policy under the lead and the will of His Majesty King Mohammed VI. Currently, we have only 11 million of Moroccans from a total of 36 million who benefit from the compulsory health insurance. The Moroccan monarch called for the generalization of compulsory medical coverage for all Moroccans by 2020, 2023. So it's 
in, in, in two years ago, and we have a governmental program, a very ambitious one, uh, who mobilized necessary resources from Morocco and uh, with, uh, with an openness to, to foreign investors to ensure this huge program and this huge uh, challenge. Uh, all citizens will be now provided with social protection, including sickness benefits and access to health services at prefer preferential conditions. Uh, uh, in general, and at the level of the MENA region, I think that we still need to work more to promote greater and more efficient investments in health systems through a coherent, well-aligned and integrated approach based on primary care. But we need also to overcome some barriers uh, to achieve in universal health care, like in some cases, the lack of political will to implement a universal health, health coverage. We also face some regional challenges around access, accessing real world data, including a lack of capacity to enable information and data sharing to ensure uh, to, to overcome this issue. I think that our governments, our parliaments, and maybe some agencies or technical agencies have to support, to collaborate, to foster transparency and ensure access to better technologies also to support, to support the development of robust evidence generation in the region. Uh, our virtual meeting today is also an occasion to share experiences and to get inspired from various parliamentary initiatives and maybe why not, through our uh, virtual forum to uh, have the occasion to identify opportunities and possible future uh, collaboration actions to accelerate progress. Uh, we are uh, organizing as, as, um, as um, uh, l l l uh, uh, honorable uh, member of parliament of Bangladesh said, we are, we are organizing a lot of meetings, but we need to, to, to focus and to make concrete actions uh, and to, to, to accelerate progress toward universal health coverage and toward building strong, resilient health systems, either at our country levels or local or regional levels. Uh, parliamentarians as democratic elected representatives of the people and of the nations have a critical role to play through the active political intervention, through the political leadership, through legislation, through challenging the public health policies and through uh, parliamentary diplomacy and public diplomacy and maybe other ways of action, we can make concrete positive change in our countries and in the world. So let's say mobilize to honor our commitments at all political levels, uh, international, regional, national and local, to leave no one behind and uh, let's say united. Thank you. Well, but thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Sari. And I'm really intrigued what you said there about Rocco, you know, really regarding the COVID-19 pandemic as a potential opportunity to accelerate UHC reforms. You know, I, I think we're seeing this in a number of countries now, and I'd like to sort of come back to this theme a little later because we're all obviously sort of desperately trying to be optimistic at the moment, thinking about how we might build back better and, and things can um, accelerate again. Because, we, of course, we recognise that the, the COVID pandemic has been a setback to the overall objective of UHC. But maybe we are seeing other countries doing exactly what you're doing, of you know, taking this as an opportunity to accelerate reform. So I'll, I, I can already see that one of the questions is, is along those lines. So I'll, I'll perhaps put that to you all in, in just a little moment. Uh, but, but finally, if we, if we go south and, and to, to, to Zambia, and I'm delighted to have with us uh, the Honorary um, um, Given uh, Katuta, who is a, an MP from, from Zambia, um, a country that I was privileged to, to work in um, a few years ago at the, the time, I think it was about 2006, where the, the president uh, removed uh, healthcare user fees in, in, in Zambia. Um, so, um, D D Dr. Katuta, you know, what, what's the situation in, in Zambia now? And, you know, how has the pandemic affected your progress to UHC? And w w which way do you see things going uh, in Zambia moving forward? Thank you so much, uh, Robert. And I'm not a doctor. Uh, oh. I hate you saying I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Honorary doctor. I'll make uh, you an honor doctor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, actually, um, I would say ever since you left, uh, there's been quite an improvement, and uh, especially that we have a new government in place. Um, 
as you are aware, uh, each country has a way of implementing the, um, uh, the, the ways of achieving the UHC. Like in Zambia, uh, we've seen currently the new government uh, announcing in the new budget that we're going to, uh, the government is going to employ more uh, medical personnel, about um, 30,000 medical personnel, 11,000, uh, those went under the field. And this is quite a, a huge, a huge milestone because uh, when this pandemic of COVID uh, happened, it was like uh, everyone didn't know what to do because we didn't have enough medical uh, staff to handle, uh, to handle the situation. So what is happening now is that the government has also, I uh, think before you left, you are aware that uh, the government uh, introduced national health scheme. Uh, we're trying to make it uh, cheaper for all the Zambians to access uh, quality health care and also removing um, fees at, pr at uh, primary uh, health uh, care services. So uh, though there's still some gaps, uh, but we've seen a lot of improvement. The, gov uh, the government is working towards uh, of bridging that gap between the urban and uh, the rural, the rural uh, areas. Uh, since the pandemic uh, of um, COVID, it's like the pandemic has its own, um, I would say its own uh, disadvantages, but it has brought more of a blessing because it has brought like a, a awakening up call for the, for the government, including the, the current government to also to prepare how they can also prevent the future um, outbreaks for other diseases. You know, in Zambia, we've had challenges, especially now that we're going towards the rain season of uh, outbreaks of cholera and uh, these other diseases like uh, typhoid. So the government Oh, I think we might be having now, some uh, has put up, which is okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that, that, that's good. Okay, sorry. I think uh, we've just we're having just a challenge. The whole country regarding internet. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, um, I was saying the government has now come up with uh, a policy which is called uh, health in all implementation uh, framework which the, the government wants to see to it that all the health uh, policies are implemented are not just on the paper. And also as parliamentarians, we are helping the government to put pressure on them that we do not want this to be just on the paper, just on the floor of the house to be debated, but want to see implementation because we've come to believe as a nation that a, a health nation is the health is a prosperous nation. And uh, you know, in Africa, most of uh, these diseases like cholera, malaria, TB, which Zambia is somehow still struggling with, and like with HIV, where Zambia has reached almost 90% of having uh, uh, most of uh, uh, patients being uh, on, uh, um, on the uh, antiviral uh, medicines. But with these other, other, other diseases like the most of uh, attention has shifted only to COVID and uh, HIV. And we're trying to remind the government as parliamentarians that we have other challenges, like uh, I've mentioned already cholera, uh, which is like, it's like every, each time there's um, rain, it's a rain season, we have outbreaks of cholera in urban and rural areas. I think they, we're having challenges because of uh, erratic kind of uh, funding from the Minister of Finance. Financing has been also a challenge, but we believe working with um, like Global Fund has been doing a great job in Zambia. We believe uh, by collaboration with such uh, uh, institution will be on the right track to make sure that uh, we get to what we're looking at uh, with the UH, uh, UHC to see to it that no one is left behind. 
Fantastic. Th thank you very much indeed. And, and you know, it's, it's great to see that, that you know, Zambia is sort of continuing the push to, to universal health coverage with these sort of national schemes coming now and, and uh, how important it is to, to cover it, that everyone, just like you say, that, and that no one gets left behind. Um, if I can go to the, the audience now and, and really encourage uh, people to ask questions, uh, I have got a stream of them that I, I can see here, some really, really good questions, but we might even be able to uh, have time to squeeze one or two more in as well. So, so don't hold back if you have a, a question for, for our panel. Uh, there's one particularly good one that I just saw that I would like to, uh, to ask. Yes, now here, here it is. And it's, do you think that after this COVID-19 crisis, politicians will be more aware of the challenges of health coverage? And will it be easier for policymakers with a health background to push for a more strong health agenda. So I suppose that, you know, the question for each of you in your countries, do, do you see now, and this sort of comes back to um, what um, we were hearing from, from Morocco about, you know, the potential opportunity here. Do you think that the political climate in your country is making it more conducive to more rapid UHC reforms? Uh, perhaps if I sort of go around the panel and the audience that spoke before. So, uh, Professor Miller, would you say that now that, that there perhaps is a, a greater political appetite for faster progress to UHC in Bangladesh? Thank you. It is, of course, an opportunity, no doubt about that. The problem is that the challenges has increased. And the priority has changed as well. As you know that economically, each and every country is suffering at the moment due to post-COVID uh, situation. And that's why the problem is that whatever intention, good intention we have, but it is difficult uh, to implement, especially increasing the budget, utilizing the budget in the proper way, uh, prioritizing uh, the need. So it's, it's a difficult situation really, in my opinion. But you know, everybody's more aware of that, that we need to do something about health. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Zari from, from Morocco, would you, would you um, perhaps elaborate a bit on, on the, the, the changing political climate in, in Morocco? You know, concerning UHC reforms. Right. Uh, in Morocco, there is now a strong political will uh, driven by His Majesty the King. And we voted in Parliament during my mandate uh, an important law regarding the, the subject of uh, universal health coverage. And the aim of this law is to include vulnerable benefit, uh, people that will be benefiting from the health assistance scheme, uh, like self-employed professionals and workers and self-employed practitioners in, in a liberal profession, for example. Uh, but we have we still have some challenges. In Morocco, we have lots of uh, like multiple health systems that we need to, to, to make some coherence and who, 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 were, uh, who have known many dysfunctions. So now there is a great work that is being made to make more coherence and to, 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 to improve the governance and the, 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 all actors, all stakeholders must have like a clear responsibility so that we can, we can follow, follow the work. But, uh, there is like a big awareness of the importance of this challenge and of this cha uh, this, uh, this this huge program and the, uh, things are really on the, the, the right way uh, to, to make uh, big pro progress and big benefits for uh, for citizens. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and given Katuto, what, what, what would you say the situation is with sort of Zambia now? Are you, are you seeing this as a a potential opportunity to, to accelerate uh, UHC reforms? Yes, um, it is a great opportunity, especially that um, the new government, uh, which we just elected into uh, government is also pushing. So it will be possible. And I've seen how the government has proposed an in, uh, increase in uh, budgetary allocation. So it's, it's possible. Terrific. That, that's encouraging. And I, I think I may have seen a hand flash up from uh, Professor Takemi. Professor Takemi, would you like to come in on, the, on that point? I, I know that you, you often speak about the, uh, the great opportunities of, of crises created for, for, for UHC. Uh, would you like to, to, to come in and make, make a point? Yes. Uh, you know, the, in Japan, 
uh, we are now facing a very serious transition period, uh, how we can you know, fight against uh, the, the pandemic and the risky infectious diseases. Maybe I really think that every you know, parliamentarians in every world uh, now are facing the similar uh, situations. And the role of the parliamentarians is huge. And the, you know, when we try to strengthen our you know, uh, health system as a resident, and then the, we do notice that uh, simultaneously we have to build up our you know, uh, the new uh, the risk management system as a part of the, our process to maintain and achieve the universal health coverage. Those are the dual process we have to consume. And in addition to that, when we try to strengthen our health securities, always we have to think how to collaborate with the WHO, World Bank, and the Global Fund and several other the global partners. And then also, uh, you know, that the, uh, we have to think how to strengthen our global health governance itself. There are so many subjects are now interconnected each other. We parliamentarians has a huge potentiality as a catalyst between the people living in the community and the changing global health, the governance and the global health communities. How we can strengthen our function of the you know, network beyond the national boundaries for the parliamentarians as a major stakeholder for the future's very important global health, the governance you know, restructuring. Therefore, when we you know, think about our domestic context of the process to achieve the universal health coverage, simultaneously, we have to think uh, how to join those of the new, the process to strengthen our global health governance. This is a really complex and the difficult you know, situations now we are facing together. So I really hope you know, this sort of a very important occasion to exchange our ideas for the universal health coverage. We also want to you know, uh, talk about those, the, what sort of the future, the governance of the global health can be expected as a view of the parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Tukemi. And I, I think that you know one thing that we're looking at here at Chatham House as well is, is this idea that the, the COVID-19 pandemic can provide great opportunities to accelerate UHC reforms. And if you look at a historical perspective, so many of the world's great universal health systems have come out of crises, uh, not least in, in, in Japan and ourselves here in the UK after the Second World War, but also in France. Thailand after the Asian financial crisis. Rwanda had very impressive health reforms after the, the, the genocide there. Um, and we, we've seen this right across the world that just at a time when you think it most unlikely to be able to launch UHC reforms because of financial pressures, it is often a thing that, that smart politicians turn to because it gets quick results and can really benefit the entire population. So, so we're very keen to, to, to partner with organizations and, and colleagues you know, to look at this issue. And, and as we're already hearing, and, and I was I'm delighted to, to hear about these reforms in Morocco, I hadn't heard about that those until, until today, but, but you're not alone. And, and you know, we are seeing this happening in other countries as well. And you know, hopefully this will be one of the silver linings of this whole pandemic, uh, that we are going to potentially see it catalyzing a new generation of UHC reforms. Um, so I thought I'd just go back to the audience questions. And, and um, there was one I saw, which uh, I know is sort of quite topical here in the UK. And, and I bet, Keizo, you have views about this as well in, in, in Japan. Um, and that's this, this issue about um, care, care of the elderly. And um, that we've often seen the situation that 
um, health coverage and, and social care services, particularly care of the elderly, have been sort of quite distinct. But we certainly found in the UK that this sort of exposed big cracks in our, in our universal health system. So the question is, regarding the elderly, how can we interconnect the social and health system to make sure that health coverage also means social care uh, at the end of many people's lives? And I think that, you know, that also, I think, alludes to discussions around palliative care. And, you know, are we seeing sufficient attention paid to that? So I don't know if anyone would like to sort of, you know, answer that question about the potential for, again, coming out of this crisis for us to integrate social care and health care. Is, is that something that maybe is under consideration in, in Bangladesh, uh, Professor Milat? Thank you again. As you said that uh, we have a demographic dividends of the young people at the moment, but in few years, the number of the elderly people will increase tremendously. In 2050, we will be double the size of the number of the population. So we are really, really worried about that. We, in our, as a culture, we had a joint family in the past. When I was a child, we had a joint family, but that culture is, the trend is changing. Now we are depending on our own family, not looking after other families. These are the things going on at the moment. And the elderly people, palliative care is different, but you know, elderly people, they are not, as because of our uh, economic condition and also social condition that, you know, they are not the earning member of the family when they become old. So they are, I shouldn't say neglected, but they are not getting proper care really. And the government has started, uh, uh, you know, some sort of incentive or as you say that like uh, 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 pay, monthly payment system that they can at least get some support from the government. But the number is increasing every day and the amount of money is increasing, but that's not enough. We need to do a lot of things about that. And other thing is that those people are suffering from serious diseases because of old age related disease. There is not many places they can get their rehabilitation. Even the old home, this is a new concept for us at the moment. So we need to work on that really. I worked in UK long, uh, eight years in, in Ireland. I saw the system there, but it will take some time, probably some few years to implement all those things in our country. It absolutely depending on political commitment and also the economic condition of the country and the selection of priority. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Keizo, would you, would you like to sort of come in? Japan, of course, is I think the greatest life expectancy yeah. in the world. So, so this has been an issue you've been grappling with for a while, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. The 28% of our total population is over 65 years old. And the, you know, those are the population dynamics is now uh, happening in everywhere. And especially the aging is a very speedy, happened in the so many countries, specifically in Asia. By 2050, 80% of the you know, population over 65 live in Asia. And in this process of the speed of aging, every country have to cope with the changing structure of the disease burden, not only for the you know, infectious diseases, but also the non-infectious diseases, diabetes and the, you know, the other uh, you know, uh, non-communicable diseases. Therefore, inevitably, Every country has to strengthen their own hist you know, health system to achieve the universal health coverage in order to cope with those the changing structure of the disease burden, even though we are under the pandemic. So we always have to think those the dual process, how to cope with those the changing structure of the population while we try to strengthen our health security. And that both you know, needs, not only the individual efforts, we always have to connect each other and collaborate each other. And then the parliamentarians' law as a catalyst are emerging in enormously in the near future. Therefore, now we have to think how to strengthen the, our function of the network beyond the national boundaries as a you know, catalyst of the parliamentarians 
you know, that, that, that's the, the point I would like to emphasize. Thank you, Rob. Fantastic. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Kesa. And I, I was just wondering if, if given, or maybe Mary Rose might like to come to I, I saw you post something in the chat there, Mary Rose. I'm not sure if you perhaps want to come on, on screen to, uh, to share your thoughts. Merci. Je souhaite m'exprimer. Je voulais dire. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. On health coverage, I wanted to say it's important that parliamentarians speak as one, because we don't all have the same tools available to us, and the situation in all our countries is a bit different. So the the, the simple fact to share all questions to the government. If a question is asked to a government in Japan, it can also be asked in Cameroon, for example, or and this goes through a network building. And it is really important to, um, how should I put it? it, it it's, um, we must learn from one another. Maybe uh, a lot of people are um, left aside, uh, left behind, and this cannot happen. And therefore, it is very important for our states, for our government, to make sure no one is left behind. And if those people left behind are not supported by their spokespersons, uh, i.e. parliamentarians, uh, it will not be solved, this issue. And even if we have to, to unite with a civil society, and I believe we, we, we should, we must, uh, and, and there is also the role of uh, the media. We have uh, to use the media, but also uh, we have different languages. So maybe we can translate what we do, what we say in different languages and uh, through the media, try to be present there and explain what we do as parliamentarians. So yes, it must be a participative endeavor. Parliamentarians must be united and not only work for the uh, national stakes or interest, but uh, we must all share our different ideas and approaches and best practices. And there is uh, this guide available. And if you have an opportunity to use it, it's available in six languages. And maybe we could uh, uh, translate it in more languages even uh, so that been simultaneous uh, some translation uh, for, for uh, audience members as well you know that uh, and really emphasizing the importance of, of uh, parliamentarians sharing ideas and and you know working through networks and the media to to, to share experiences across countries and i think you know this this really has, has been one of the great themes of this summit really you know that that how do we uh, have a united front in, in tackling communicable diseases and and the importance of bringing together uh, parliamentarians, with technical actors, with civil society, with media, um, and you know how important it is that we do this. Um, I think if we are reflective in global health, there, there has often been a tendency for technical agencies and people to, yes. to uh, pr pr preach to the converted, you know, to, to, to talk amongst themselves and not really engage enough with uh, parliamentarians. And I think it's been one of the the beauties of the, of the UHC movement is that universal health coverage is overtly political. You know, it, it's, it's something that the politicians appreciate and understand. It's something that, that um, societal members, you know, take to the streets to demand. And, and obviously politicians recognize the importance of delivering universal health coverage. So I think it's a real sort of politician's issue, really. And, and uh, I, I think it's been you know, marvellous that the global health community has rallied around universal health coverage and I think has enabled much better dialogue about the importance of health and health coverage of populations with politicians. And really, it's, it's to the credit of uh, UNITE and, and uh, the Global Fund and, and UHC 2030 in, in facilitating these discussions. And um, I think we've had a, an absolutely uh, fantastic discussion today. Um, I'd, I'd really like to, to thank all the panelists from all over the world uh, for sharing their experiences um, about their, their own transitions to universal health coverage. Obviously, we've all been through a, a dreadful two years where, you know, just objectively, you, you can see that, that 
services have been hit, populations in um, situations have been left behind. That goes to my own country as well. Even, you know, rich countries with supposedly sophisticated UHC systems have, have been hit hard. We have here in the UK. But I think we collectively, we are learning now about the responses. And, and it is very noticeable how pretty much every country is employing similar tactics of, of um, the populations putting pressure on their governments to deliver universal services, publicly financed health services. And as I mentioned at the outset, you're even seeing in the United States now, I, I think the, the appetite for universal publicly financed services, particularly around vaccines. So maybe this is even going to accelerate progress to UHC in the United States. And uh, that's going to be a very uh, interesting one to watch in, in coming uh, years. And, and I'd just like to say on, on behalf of, of, of Chatham House, uh, how you know, we'll be delighted to work with you as, as partners in this. We are trying to sort of fulfill this role of bringing together the, uh, the health community, the economic community and, and politicians to talk quite openly about the health, economic and political benefits of universal health coverage. And I think it's, you know, that if you look through history, one can see, as I mentioned, that it is often coming out of crises that, that smart progressive politicians have realized how they can implement very successful UHC reforms relatively quickly if they put sufficient resources in and they give it true political commitment. And it is our great hope that we're going to see coming out of this dreadful crisis an acceleration towards universal health coverage. And if we in Chatham House can facilitate that one way or another uh, through closed Chatham House meetings or, or public discussions, we'd be absolutely delighted to partner with you in, in that. Um, but for the time being, thank you very much indeed for, from London. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed our, our discussion today. And I'd just like to, to hand back to, to Katya, who I think will close out the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. What a firework of aspects commitment, experience, and initiative on universal health coverage. I very much like the slogan used in one of the films that we saw, we have to be all in. For us here in the program of this summit, the next step is to move into a longer break so that you will have time for lunch and emails, etc. We will break for one hour and 45 minutes so please be all be back after that time. We will resume the meeting again at 2 p.m. GMT, 3 p.m. CET. Have a lovely break and see you all later today.